So next up, we have Sarah Starusta. Sarah is a trained psychologist. She received her PhD in experimental neuroscience from the International Graduate School of Neuroscience at Ruhr University, Bochum, working with Dr. Onur Gunturkun, where she investigated the neuronal basis of extinction learning. She is currently a postdoc working with Adam Kepex, studying the behavioral and neuronal algorithms that underlie decisions in a foraging setting. Her overarching goal is understanding how neuronal circuitry gives rise to complex phenomena, such as learning and decision-making in health and disease. Today, she's gonna to talk to us about dopamine and the algorithmic basis of foraging decisions. Sarah, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Um, can I share my screen? I think, Luke, you have your screen still shared. Okay, great. That should work, right? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the very uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here today, and I want to thank the organizers to setting this up. I already enjoyed the conference earlier this year a lot, and it's even more excited to be part of it uh, today. So, um, as you said, I'm generally interested in how we make decisions and how different variables are represented in the brain and how our brain managed to use these variables to allow us to make adaptive um, decisions. And today I'm going to be talking about dopamine, surprise, surprise, and its role in the um, decisions that are made in a foraging context. But before I'm going to talk about this, I want to take like a little step back and discuss um, the the problem of decision making as a neuroscientific problem. And um, in general, what I think or what people in, um, in the field think is that we are as uh, humans as well as other animals are subjected to an environment where we face all kinds of decisions every day. As an example, in a private setting, we might face the decisions what we want to eat for dinner. And the general idea is that we can mani manipulate the environment and then observe the behavior, so the decision that the subject is making, to infer the computation that must have taken place in the brain. And we assume that this computation takes place either in signal neurons or in specific brain areas or networks of neurons. And you can also uh, employ computational models to infer uh, these computations. And I kind of apply this approach to foraging um, decisions. However, what's usually done in, decision, in the decision-making field in neuroscience that there are paradigms that are using what I would call multiple choice decisions. So there's a choice A and there's a choice B. And if you decide what you want to have for dinner, you might want to decide if you eat an apple or eat a piece of pizza. And we discussed that uh, a bit in the last talk already. These decisions are assumed to be based on value. And this is then called value-based decision-making. And one task that you could imagine for rodents, um, the same model that I'm using for the foraging setting, is that they would decide to make a left turn to get a big reward or make a right turn to get a small reward. On the other hand, there's, um, there are a couple of paradigms that are using so-called perceptual decision-making, where a stimulus, so a percept, tells the organism um, how to act. So there would be, again, option A and option B, but it's based on the percept um, of the organism. So for example, uh, a tone that tells you if you heard a flute, you should choose option A, or if you heard a trumpet, you should choose option B. And also these kind of tasks are employed in uh, the neuroscientific field a lot. Here's a, um, here's a um, figure from our own lab where they use odors to direct the choices um, of the animals to receive a reward. So these kind of tasks are used a lot in the um, neuroscientific community to investigate decision making. However, I would claim that there's kind of a third kind of decision that's even more basic than that and that we do every day. And that's the decision if we want to stay what, what we are doing right now or if we want to change to a new course of action or to a new option. 
And this one would assume that you have option A already and you just decide in every um, time point uh, in your life if you want to stay with option A or don't want option A anymore. And one example for that would be you are at a party where there are several people around that you want to talk to. However, your time is limited, so you have to decide how long you want to stick with one conversation partner, option A, or when you want to switch to another conversation partner. And these kinds of decisions have been investigated in the foraging field and in foraging theory um, a lot in terms of foraging of animals um, in food patches. So the idea is that food is located in different patches and animals run around and want to collect these foods and um, have to decide at every given point in time if they want to stay in the current food patch or move over to the next one. And this is similar that they decide on every given time point if they want to stick with option A or look for another option. And also foraging decisions have been investigated more and more recently in the neuroscientific literature. However, one characteristic that was not always um, implemented in the task that we're using and we think is very important is that state decisions um, in the foraging setting are usually characterized by diminishing, diminishing returns. And what do I mean with that? I mean with that, that if you every time you decide to stay with option A, what you get out of it, staying with option A, is actually decreasing because you're staying at this bush, for example, and every time you stay, less and less berries are available, so your returns are decreasing over time. And I think that this is one very specific characteristic that's very important um, in the wild, and we wanted to model that and to understand this kind of um, decision making in the lab. And uh, for that, we took kind of three approaches. First of all, we designed a foraging task for mice uh, in the lab that modeled this diminishing returns. Second, we employed computational modeling to infer the algorithm that the animals um, might be using to solve this task under, circum under different circumstances. And third, we looked at dopamine um, and wanted to see if this algorithm and this decision strategy is somewhat implemented in the signal in the VTA. So let me tell you a bit about the task that I, I was using to investigate this decision-making process. So mice were free to run back and forth between two ports, port A and port B. And whenever they enter a port, they got a drop of water. And to model this diminishing returns, what we did was that every time the animal stayed with this option, option A or port A, the amount of uh, water was decreasing over time. And however, when the mouse moved over to the other port, the amount of water was reset to the full amount. And if they then stayed again, the decreasing started from new. And this is how um, a typical session in this paradigm looks like. You start at a high water amount here on the y-axis, and then with every stay at port A, the amount of water is decreasing. However, if they mo move over to port B in blue, the amount is reset and then the decreasing starts again. And I'm interested in how do the animals decide when they actually leave. So what are the endpoints um, of these curves and what defines these end curves? And here's a video of the mouse performing this task. So it just moved over, got a big reward. And with every stay decision, the amount of water that the animal is getting is slowly decreasing over time. And then it decides to move over pokes the nose again into the port, gets a big reward, and then the depleting um, starts again. And when we were uh, trying to figure out how animals solve this task and what's their strategy um, behind this, we were inspired again by a foraging theory and a theorem that's called the marginal value theorem. And this theorem offers a decision rule for environments exactly um, like the one I just described to you with diminishing returns. And this decision rule states that you should switch, so disengage from option A, whenever the next expected outcome is lower than the opportunity cost. Um, and what are the opportunity costs? The opportunity costs are the average reward rate times the harvesting time. So whatever you get on average um, and how long you have to wait until the next reward is available. So how much do you lose while waiting for the next reward to be available um, on average uh, is the opportunity cost. And this 
the nice thing about this theory is that it makes pretty clear prediction um, of what should happen. So what should happen is that while the reward is decreasing over time, here shown in blue, uh, whenever it would uh, hit this threshold, which is the average reward rate times the harvesting time, so the opportunity cost, the animal should switch. And another prediction or the general prediction is that whenever you manipulate either the reward or the average reward rate or the harvesting time, you should see a change in behavior. And that's exactly what we did. So we manipulated these three parameters and looked at the behavior output of the animal. And uh, these predictions in detail are that the lower the next expected reward, the higher the probability of leaving. And second, the longer the harvesting time, so the higher the opportunity cost, the higher the probability on, of leaving. And lastly, the higher the average reward rate, and again, the higher the opportunity cost, the higher the probability of leaving. So the first thing that we looked at in our mice behavior was then uh, how does the next expected reward influence the probability of leaving. And what you see here is the probability of leaving as a function of the water amount the animal would get. And as you can see, and this makes also intuitively sense, that the smaller the um, amount of water the animals would receive next, the higher the probability of leaving. And this was in a low average reward rate um, um, environment in this case. And then we manipulated the average reward rate in a, a way that it was high again, so the amount of reward per time unit was increased. And what we observed was that uh, this, uh, the animals in this high average reward rate environment actually left at earlier time points. So the curve was shifted to the right, which means that for the same amount of water, the probability of leaving was higher. And then we manipulated um, the harvesting time, so the, the delay between uh, two rewards. And what would be predicted by that, again, that the opportunity costs are increasing and that the animals are even leaving earlier. And that's exactly what we observed. So if we introduced a high harvesting time, the curve of the animal's behavior was shifted again to the right, which means that they left at even earlier time points. And if we introduced a high average reward rate and a high harvesting time combined together, the animals left even earlier. So there was kind of a sum effect of these two um, parameters. So we were pretty excited about that because this actually meant that all the predictions of the marginal value theorem that was developed for foraging behavior in the wild were actually met by the um, behavior that we observed in um, in the lab. So the next expected reward, the lower this one was, the higher the probability of leaving, the longer the harvesting time, the higher the probability of leaving, and again, similarly, the higher the average reward rate, the higher the probability um, of leaving again. And that was really encouraging and we we're very happy about that. However, our final goal was to relate a single trial uh, neuronal activity to single trial decision making in the animal. And the manipulation that I just showed you uh, showed to you were manipulations that we did um, over a longer time frame. So we had subjected animals for longer times to different environments. So what we wanted to do is to induce a single trial, trial by trial manipulations. And what we did was that we manipulated um, or violated this depleting schedule. So I explained to you that usually with every state decision, the animal got less and less um, water. However, every once in a while, we introduced a surprising large or small reward. So either it was bigger than expected or it was lower than expected. And then we observed the behavior output. And what we observed was actually pretty uh, surprising to us because in the case of the higher than expected reward, we saw that uh, the animals were actually more likely to disengage from this port again. So here um, depicted in yellow, that when they just received a very high reward, they were more likely uh, to leave. And similarly, when we presented them with a lower than expected reward, the sh uh, curve was shifted to the left here in blue, uh, which means that they actually stayed longer um, at this port. And um, this was, as I said, very surprising to us because what's basically happening here is that the mouse is running back and forth and gets like a really, really big reward at this port, 
but what they do is that it's um, what we observe is that they are more likely to disengage uh, from the sport. And this behavior is not even not in line with the marginal value theorem, but it's also in contrast to like classical ideas of uh, psychology or reinforcement learning in a psychological sense and the law of effect of Thorndike, which states that whatever uh, happened before something good happened should be um, repeated over and over again. So we were a bit puzzled by this behavior result, but also very excited and teamed up uh, with Sergey to see if we could frame this uh, behavior or this decision-making problem um, as a reinforcement learning problem. And to make a long story short, and I don't have time to go into detail here, um, when we used uh, conventional Q and uh, V learning approaches, we couldn't reproduce this behavioral um, effect of earlier leaving when uh, animals received a bigger than expected reward. Um, and we tried to figure out why did they fail to um, explain this behavior. And one idea that we came up with was that the decision might not be encoded by more than one previous reward, because that's usually what's happening in this uh, classical uh, learning models. So we used logistic regression um, to analyze the behavior data and figured out that, or wanted to figure out how past trials affect the current decision. And we figured out, and I don't show you the data here, but we figured out that around 20 last um, rewards are affecting the decision of the animal to stay or leave. So a possible solution that Sergey came up with that was that we could, deep neural, could use deep neural networks to incorporate this history of rewards into the state definition. And that's what we did, or what he did. So we used a deep relearning model in an actor-critic framework, actually, um, that incorporated or got as input this uh, 20 last reward that the animal received, as well as the action that the animal um, has been taken, and um, used this model to predict the behavior after this surprising rewards. However, um, what we observed was that also this model could not explain the behavior that we observed. So um, what this model would predict is that the animals leave independent of the rewards that just happened recently. They would just leave all at the same um, time point. And this is actually the same prediction that uh, MVT, so the marginal value theorem, would uh, give in these kind of situations. So, and the next step that we did was um, using a deep R model that actually was able to um, explain the data. And uh, you can see here that this model nicely um, predicts this earlier disengagement after a higher than expected reward. And we think that this was the case because we changed um, another parameter here. So first of all, we again incorporated these last 20 uh, rewards um, as an input to the model. And secondly, we, um, as a value function, we incorporated the average reward rate as it's done in our models uh, usually. And what was maximized in this model was the difference between the average reward rate and the current reward. And we think that these two parameters are critical to explain um, the behavior change that we observed. And let me give you an intuition um, for this based on the marginal value theorem. Um, what we observe here, or what the model is implementing as a strategy here, is that we have a locally updating average reward rate, which we call the leaky average reward rate, that is updated on every trial um, and not, as compared to the classic MVT, a fixed uh, threshold. And with that kind of adjustment, you can easily explain this higher leaving threshold after a higher than expected reward. So this second bump here in the actual reward when the current reward is higher than expected leads to also a higher average reward rate and in combination that leads to a higher probability um, to switch. Uh, whereas the classic MBT would predict the same threshold for all conditions. And since this is similar to MBT with uh, the exception that we use this um, leaky average um, we call this the leaky, mag the leaky marginal value theorem, which would uh, predict or would 
give the decision rule that one sh should switch whenever the next expected outcome is lower than the leaky average reward rate. So I told you so far that we uh, used this foraging um, paradigm with diminishing returns and changed uh, different parameters and confronted animals with surprising rewards to infer their decision uh, strategy and then employed computational modeling to figure out what strategy they are actually using and with what kind of um, algorithm that would be in line. And now I want to talk about the dopamine um, recordings that we did and how we think this connects to the um, decision making process and the computational model. And I used here fiber photometry and freely moving uh, mice during this forwarding task. Um, these were dead cream mice, and we used um, GCAM 6 f um, And I want to give a short motivation for looking at dopamine. And this motivation was basically twofold. So first of all, I think everyone here is aware that there has been a huge amount of work linking the dopaminergic system with reinforcement learning algorithms. But usually this is done um, in a Q or in V-learning um, context where the delta or the prediction error is, um, is assumed to predict, uh, to be reflected in dopaminergic activity um, in the VTA. Um, and um, I showed you this figure of our R learning model um, earlier, and also this actor critic model, of course, has a TD error. And we were wondering if in this case of um, the foraging task, we would see a correlation of this TD error with the dopaminergic activity in the VTA. And on the other hand, we were also interested in if uh, we would see a neural correlate of the average reward rate of the environment because this has also been um, claimed to be reflected in the dopaminergic activity. And I hope I made the point clear that like one really important part of this model and that defines the behavior strategy is this average reward rate of the environment that defines when the animals are leaving this depleting option. Okay, so the first thing that we looked at was what is happening when the animals are receiving the reward. So what you see here is um, the change in fluorescence uh, compared to baseline, which uh, we use as a proxy as neuronal activity based on this calcium signals. And what you can see that at time point zero, not very surprisingly, we see this um, spike in neuronal activity, which is basically um, a reward response to the drop of water that the animal is receiving. And you can see that this reward response is relative to the amount that the animal uh, is receiving. So a high amount elicits a bigger response than a low amount. And if we plot that as a correlation of the peak, um, peak reward response uh, with the reward amount that the animals are receiving, we see that there is some kind of correlation, but it's not particularly high. And if we look that uh, look at that in um, more detail throughout the trial, so correlate on every given time point throughout the trial, the neuronal activity with the reward amount the animal is receiving in this trial, we see that there is a correlation around 500 milliseconds after reward delivery. But as I said before, it's uh, not particularly high. So the VTA dopamine neurons in this task when animals receive um, a reward of different sizes, um, they reflect the size to some degree, but not particularly much. And as I um, said earlier, we also wanted to look at if the dopaminergic signal is reflecting the average reward rate. So for every trial, we computed the average reward rate, um, or the model did. So in every trial, there's an updated average reward rate. And we correlated that again with the VTA dopaminergic activity. And what we observed was basically that there's no correlation. So we didn't see a reflection of the average reward rate in the VTI responses. Okay. And the last thing, as I said, that we wanted to look at was uh, the prediction error. And I want to remind you here that um, we had this behavioral manipulation where we violated this decreasing um, reward amounts um, by giving them a higher than expected or lower than expected reward. And this is basically the very definition of a prediction error, right? They predict something, but they get something higher or they get something lower. 
So we uh, took these mice and they were pre-trained without the surprising rewards. And similarly, we took our neural network that was pre-trained on like the normal task without the surprising rewards and then conf uh, confronted them with these surprising rewards and violated the depleting schedule and then observed the dopaminergic activity in VTA with the TD error that was produced in the R learning model that could explain the behavior. And what we observed was this. So here you see again the change in fluorescent um, as a function of time um, relative to reward delivery. And we had kind of four conditions. So first of all, we had high reward sizes. So I showed you earlier that the uh, dopaminergic activity was correlated at least to some degree with the reward size that the animal received. So this would be uh, the red traces. And we had uh, a low amount of water, which would be um, the yellow traces. And then we differentiated further between the low amount that was expected by the depleting schedule in normal trials and the low unexpected um, rewards that were of similar size or that, uh, of, of the same size, but were unexpected and because of these lower than expected rewards that we introduced. And similarly, we had the high um, reward size trials that were either expected or unexpected. And what you can see here is that in the case of the high unexpected one, we observed the highest neuronal activity followed by the high expected ones. And uh, kind of classic to the ideas of prediction error coded, the low unexpected ones um, were the lowest and we saw even some kind of uh, inhibition um, at some point. So we kind of saw a classic um, prediction error coding in uh, in this uh, response here. And we were pretty um, amazed by this, that we could see that even um, kind of trial by trial, that when you see this high rewards that were surprising, so here with this blob around the, um, around the water drop, that was like significantly higher than the same amount of water that was um, expected. And kind of the mirror image for the low um, reward. And then, as I said, we wanted to relate this prediction error coding um, with the prediction error that we uh, generated in the model. And when we did that, we observed that this prediction error in the R learning or the leaky MVT, um, as we would call it, was uh, kind of highly correlated with the VTA dopaminergic um, activity around 500 milliseconds after um, reward delivery. And um, to make a side note here, this was not only the case for the R learning, but the V and R learning model, the prediction error used in these two models were actually pretty uh, similar. So on, uh, based on this parameters, we were not able to differentiate the two models or differentiate um, or say that only um, dopaminergic activity is only in line with one model or the other. However, on a behavior basis, we uh, were pretty, um, it was pretty consistent that only the R model could um, explain the data. Okay, and with that, I would like to summarize and give a small outlook and tell you why we think that is very exciting. And we think that's very exciting because uh, I showed to you today a new behavior paradigm to study this stay or leave decisions or the foraging decisions to decide in the context of diminishing returns when uh, to leave and switch over to to a different uh, option and decide if you want to have A or not A. And we think that we observe there a kind of new mode of behavior decision making that's implementing um, a strategy that uh, is very essential in a lot of different um, decision making processes that we make every day. And we have this very uh, counterintuitive behavioral observation that unpredicted large reward what led the animal to leave the source earlier. So here in this case of, uh, of the yellow curve that when they got a higher than expected reward, they were more likely um, to disengage. And neither reinforcement learning in a classical psychological sense, nor in a computer science sense in Q and V learning was able to um, explain um, this data. And only this deep R learning model that we used could reproduce the animal's behavior um, and we think the critical parameters that we changed was 
that we have this new approach to define states and to incorporate the average reward rate for these uh, kind of tasks. And if uh, I come back to this example of how to decide on a party when to disengage uh, from one conversation partner and switch over to the other, you could imagine that if you are in a very rich environment with a high average reward rate, which means that there are a lot of intelligent people around that you uh, want to talk to, you are probably also likely to spend less time with one person to make sure that you can also um, sample from all the other ones. Okay, and lastly, in regard to dopamine neuron activity, I've shown you that uh, this activity is uh, reflecting the reward prediction errors and is correlated with the errors that we use in the R learning model or that was uh, generated in the R learning model uh, with these um, surprising rewards. And we think that's a kind of an exciting novel connection of dopamine coding and R learning. Okay, and then I would like to thank you, uh, all people that were involved, especially Sergey, as well as Alexei and uh, Aubrey, who was the technician in the lab, and of course, Adam and all of the Capish lab. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Very interesting talk, Sarah. So, we yeah we do have a few questions. So, first question is from Matt Kleinman. Looks like I had a similar question actually. So I'm just gonna uh, ask his question. So, uh, nice talk and task. If you have successfully trained your animals to expect a certain total volume of water from the foraging patch, then introducing a larger than expected reward may suggest to them that there is less volume remaining in the patch after that larger reward. Is that explanation consistent with your data? Are there any ways to map that sort of explanation to your neural network model? Yeah, very good question. Um, we asked the same and we um, looked at, um, at the different manipulations and looked at if the amount of water that they were used to that they get from from a port uh, could explain the um, behavior and it was not possible uh, or it was not the case so um, the the variable of how much water would be in the uh, port left or in the food patch left could not explain um, the behavior or not as well as this idea of the average reward rate um, I'm not completely sure how we could implement that in the neural network. Um, yeah, I mean, we could just add, I guess, a variable um, and think about if this like explains the variance. Um, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for this right now. Okay, great. So I had a I had a similar sort of question. I'm. Let me see if I can articulate my question properly. Uh, so I'm trying to wrap my head around sort of your initial, the way you set up the uh, the, uh, the the initial surprising finding. So so the problem I'm having is that so these 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 animals have been trained to expect a decreasing schedule, right? So so they 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 know that you know barring these sort of special catch trials the water level is going to keep going down. So they've already learned that. Now, every once in a while, if they happen to get a larger reward than they expect, then it's conceivable that they would also have learned that that means that the next trial is probably going to be smaller. Yes. Right? Because, right? And similarly, if they get a smaller than expected reward, then it's possible that they would have also learned that that means that in the next trial they're going to get a larger reward sort of going back to the to the statistics of sort of the standard statistics so i guess what i'm getting at is that that naively i would actually expect so if i was playing the game if i suddenly got a larger than expected reward then i would not want to stay i would want to leave because i know that after this it's almost 100% going to go down because these catch trials are very rare. So mm -hmm. I guess the way I would, so to rephrase it a little bit, if you look at sort of 
reward prediction error, there is, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, isn't there some sort of underlying assumption about the, the statistics that that you would expect? And so in this case, I don't think that we can make the same sort of assumptions because it's, uh, does that make sense? Do you, do you sort of yeah, see what I'm getting at? Sense. The only thing that I can say to you that um, we didn't implement it exactly this way as you described. So whenever there was a um, higher or lower than expected reward, it didn't go back to like the normal schedule. It just went like it just started decreasing. So you're right to say that after a higher than expected reward, the next one's going to be low, but it's also just going to be low this like 80% that we always did um, in terms of decreasing. Um, and in uh, in regard to the lower than expected reward, it was not higher um, afterwards. It's also It was also decreasing. So we just kind of skipped a part and then started the normal decreasing schedule again. Uh, I see. So you didn't go back to the, the original schedule. You started from, I see. I see. Because, okay. Uh, okay, this was a surprise and now it's going to decrease again, independent of if it was higher or lower than expected. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. So I need to think about what that means. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, okay. Um, so here's a question from Nao Uchida. He asks, can you exclude the possibility that mice decide to leave after collecting a certain amount? Yeah, so I think that's very similar to the quantity question. So these are two other variables that could explain the leaving behavior of the animals. So either how much they already uh, consumed in one port or that they have kind of a fixed rule that, I that they always leave at like five microliters or something like that. And we also looked at that and uh, doing all these different um, conditions and uh, we don't see that the a fixed amount is uh, can explain the leaving um, behavior. I so see. yes, we can exclude that. I guess. Ben, did you did you have a question? Well, obviously, the most surprising find that I saw is this really uh, this this behavioral issue where they just leave after big rewards. Uh, and I was wondering about you know you're in the cabbage lab, so there's this all this work about confidence and uncertainty. I wonder whether uncertainty uh, could play a role here. There is sort of increased variance in the, the environment because you get this, this surprising result and that, that could affect the behavior. Uh, have you tried looking at that? I know the Kepich lab has very nice models talking about you know, confidence or, or uncertainty as well. Yeah, um, we haven't done that in detail yet, but one thing that we were thinking about is that for sure, that variability probably also um, induces expiration, right? That's usually no. And maybe um, this uh, behavior uh, could be explained by more expiration. However, that's only the case for the higher than expected rewards. So um, that they disengage earlier. However, that they stay longer after uncertainty and a lo lower than expected reward, that would not be explained by uncertainty inducing um, expiration. Okay, so we have a question from Andrew Westbrook. He says, great talk, Sarah. Why do you think an unexpectedly good reward should be credited to the background average reward to a greater degree than it, it is credited to the expected value of the foreground patch? Um, I'm not sure if, like, yeah, I understood the question. Um, I don't have uh, an argument for that, but um, if it would be attributed to the foreground patch, we would observe the behavior, the, the, the opposite behavior pattern. So if the update um, that they get a high reward and that's updating the value of this patch, then we would, uh, would predict the opposite um, behavior pattern, which means that it's not my opinion, but more an empirical question and that the behavior we observe is aligned with this updating of the average reward rate, but not with updating the value um, of the foreground um, patch reward rate. Ritwik Niyogi has a question. Uh, great work, Sarah. Is your argument that an unexpected reward 
I generates think that's an, the one we just had, right? Oh, was that the? No, this is. Uh, oh, okay. No, Sorry. no, this is this is a different question. Yeah, okay. this is it. Might it might be similar. <laughs> uh, this is a different question, I think. Yeah, in is your argument that an unexpected reward generates an RPE, which then increases the reward rate? In your work, how is the reward rate modulated by an unexpected reward? Um, we just incorporated in the average reward rate across the last um, 20 trials. So um, when they get an unexpected higher reward, this is just part of the last 20 trials, then we calculate the average reward rate uh, over. And we uh, are thinking also about if there should be some kind of extra parameter or some like um, weighing of the surprising reward that they should go more into the average reward rate or have less of an influence, but um, that's that's still in progress. But yes, we would argue that um, the unexpected rewards are part and the RPD, RPE that is producing a part of the average reward rate and are just incorporated in that. Okay, great. So I have a I have a sort of broad question uh, as well. So when you started your talk, you sort of set this whole framework in terms of foraging theory, right? And you have different patches, and there could be diminishing uh, diminishing returns uh, when you stay in a patch. So one of so one of the key sort of components of foraging theory in, in ecology, for example, is that if you leave a patch and go to a different patch, you don't know what that other patch is going to have. Right. So often animals are trying to figure out, should I stay here where there is some food or should I leave and go to a new patch? And I don't know what that new patch is going to have. It might have a lot of food, but it might have nothing. And so that is often how ecologists talk about foraging. So did you ever look at sort of that kind of scenario where the, the animals were not sure what would happen if they left this patch? Yeah. Yeah, very good question. That's actually one of the beauties, beauty um, of this theory that it um, allows that you don't compute a lot of variables. You just have to know what you have right now and what's there on average, but you don't have to know every single patch that is out there, right? That's kind of the, the nice thing about this theory that is kind of an easy decision rule where you don't need a lot of variables. Um, however, we are like totally aware that how we model it right now, the animals are kind of sure what the other options is. But there's also another variant of the task that I actually didn't talk about, where the starting values, so where it starts and from what it is depleting, are random. So they don't know if the next patch, so the other side, is of um, high value or of low value. And we see a similar behavior also when we induce this uh, surprises that. So um, this two port doesn't look like there's uncertainty, but we have a variant of the task that's implementing that. So yeah, that's a very interesting question. Ben, did you? Yeah, so I was, I mean, I guess everybody's trying to find a, a sort of an explanation for <laughs> rather behavior results. Uh, and so, but we have one, right? I mean, the R network solved it. It, it. So we have some, at least some way to try to get intuition on that. So, uh, and you did give some, but I was, it was a bit hard for me to follow. Can you please uh, explain a little bit more, try to give some intuition about what is it about the R network that is able to replicate uh, this result? I remember you said something about you defining the states in a different way and you're taking into account the reward rates. So can you please a little bit elaborate on that? Uh, to give us a, a, some intuition about how is it uh, replicating this result. Yeah, so that, that's basically it, that we were able with this um, the, with this network to uh, calculate this local average reward rate that can explain this local changes in, in the behavior. And I think the nice thing, even though this R model seems like, yeah, we did like some deep neural network and that's fancy, it actually relates back to the MVT um, which also has this critical parameter of the average reward rate um, that is optimized in the value function or the difference between the current reward and the average um, reward rate. So, yeah, this is basically um, the, the magic behind it that these two parameters are uh, incorporated in the models and can, can be related back to the marginal value theorem. 
So just a follow up, thinking about how would this be instantiated, you know, in the circuitry, is that a prediction that you would have a representation of the different uh, reward rates or average values of the different options somewhere in the brain and that this is using in an ongoing computation to make decisions? Yeah, so we very much think about it uh, in a similar way that this average reward rate of the different um, environments or in this environment is represented um, somewhere, maybe in the Nicholas Accumbens, as some people um, might suggest, um, and that this information is then used to inform um, more higher order uh, brain regions like MPFC um, to implement the decision and in instruct the um, the action that that uh, that follows from from uh, the variables that are transmitted to these regions. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, that, uh, so, it, do you think about are you thinking about testing it in some experimental way? Do you have ideas about future experiment to sort of test this hypothesis that you just uh, mentioned? Yeah, we are thinking about um, first of all also looking at uh, dopamine signaling in MPFC. So we want to um, use the sensors to record there and see if what kind of signal basically uh, is um, transmitted to these regions. And of course, it uh, also makes sense to combine maybe stimulation of dopamine and uh, artificially induce this prediction error or higher than expected rewards and see how um, activity, for example, in MPFC um, is changing and how behavior is changing um, parallel um, to that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would be, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. No, no, go ahead. So, uh, Victor, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Okay. It was pretty fast, huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think, yeah, I was just going to say that that would be interesting to see if you used optogenetics, for example, to sort of reproduce this, uh, the, the reward schedule and see if you get the same behavioral effect and or if there's something extra that you need uh, in your model. So I guess, uh, yeah, I guess we just have a few minutes and I think I, I agree with Ben that it would be nice to have a little bit more sort of intuition. I'm trying to wrap my head around this as well. So just so going back to like how you started your talk with, with animals going to different patches, you know, berry bushes, right? So I'm imagining a squirrel in a berry bush and, you know, he's eating the berries and then suddenly he finds more berries on like the other side of the bush. And then he decides to leave and go find a different bush. What What is the sort of the very, very, intuitively like what what is the logic of that from what would you say is the reason why the animal leaves the reason or the like intuition is that this um like surprise find of like a better than expected patch uh, or a lot of berries um inform you that the um, environment might have changed and that your environment is actually better than you assumed before and this is increasing your average reward rate so um, you are more likely to leave, and it makes sense to uh, like disengage and look also in other places because you assume or you extend this notion of a very good reward to other places that might have been gotten better than you assumed. Um, also, uh, I see, I see, I see. So you're saying that when the, when the squirrel finds extra berries, the squirrel thinks that overall the world is just a better place and the other bushes are also likely to be sort of everything is elevated and yes and I'm aware that this is kind of a broad claim on the other hand <laughs> there are like seasons of um like fruit availability etc so it might actually be that like the seasonal changes of how much food is available um is related to that that if you actually now figure out oh wow it's spring now and everything is fresh and new and there's more food available. It's not only in this patch that I'm in right now, but maybe in all the other ones also. Right, right, right. And the new patches will have even more berries. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> okay, great, uh, thank you very much. I think it's uh, it's time to move on to the to the next speaker.